In the early hours of July the 28th, 1794, the leaders of the French Republic's Committee of Public Safety had gathered for one last time. What's wrong? Their once colossal power evaporating with every minute. But under whose name? For 12 months, Maximilien Robespierre had ruled revolutionary France in the name of the people. The convention has ceased to represent the people. We must sign in the but name But now, in the name of the people, soldiers were on their way to seize him. His dictatorship was over. Do you think we should sign in the name of the people? And he was about to become the final victim of his own bloody reign of terror. What happened next to Robespierre is still not fully known. Two shots were fired. and one hit him flush in the mouth. A badly wounded Robespierre was ultimately finished off by the guillotine, but arguments about the man still rage. Had his revolution created the modern world, or betrayed it? It was really a system of loathsome paranoia, which was responsible for the butchering of tens of thousands of perfectly innocent lives. But wait a minute, in a liberal way, you know, liberals don't like people who are ready to sacrifice themselves. For them, if you are too radical, you are already one step towards uh, totalitarianism. At stake is the status of Robespierre as a founding father of state terror. The first in a line of modest men with access to a higher truth. Men who loved humanity so much, they felt entitled to exterminate the human beings who stood in its way. One year to the day before his grisly death, Maximilien Robespierre was appointed to the Committee of Public Safety. The innocuous four words disguising the most awesome institution in revolutionary France. A provincial lawyer from Arras, he'd been destined for a life of obscurity until 1789, when he was propelled into the storm center of the greatest event in history since the fall of the Roman Empire, the French Revolution. The revolutionaries had challenged the might and arrogance of the French court in Versailles. They'd executed their king and created a republic, whose watchwords were liberty, equality and the rights of man. A government whose sovereignty was based in the people. But the revolutionaries also dreamed of a new type of society, one where human nature might be born again where men and women, freed from tyranny and social custom, could achieve moral perfection. No one believed in this republic of virtue more than Robespierre himself. But in Robespierre, the Jacobin, the world got its first glimpse of a new type. A man who believed that the road to virtue lay not through persuasion, but through terror. Virtue without terror is impotent, terror without virtue is blind, no? I accept this totally, I don't have any problem, I don't have any problem. I mean, I mean uh, the crucial point of every radical movement is to have terror through virtue. In order to establish the fundamentals of democracy, you have to go through this zero level of Jacobinism. You cannot say we could have done it in a much easier way. Have we learned nothing from the Gulag? Have we learned nothing from the Third Reich? It's, it's unconscionable and horrifying in the name of intellectual fashion and a kind of patrician remoteness, you know, the sense in which, above all, it doesn't really matter if thousands and thousands of people are slaughtered, as long as some are bourgeois notions of liberal individual rights are overthrown. The use of violence to perfect humanity was the brainchild of the Committee of Public Safety. In 1793, the unruly energies released by the revolution had been bottled up in this room. And it was here, in 12 murderous months, 
that the modern idea of state terror was born. It's a moment in time when a society really does try and change itself without a model to fall back on, without a real sense of the edges of possibility. And seeing how that can go very badly wrong is, of course, an object lesson. The men on the Committee of Public Safety who worked the levers of this powerful machine included Lazar Carnot, mathematician, engineer and natural-born bureaucrat. His rival was the puritanical Saint-Just, whose astonishing maiden speech in the assembly had called for the execution of the king. Well, take the liquor out of the convention hall and you'll get more rational debates. Perhaps. But I've also known crashing bores who swear allegiance to only lemonade. A third member was the crippled lawyer Georges Couton. Thank you, citizens. Thank you. On his very first day as deputy, Couton had proposed the abolition of royalty. And before the revolution, he'd won a literary prize for an essay on patience. Come on! Come on! Put your backs into it! Another lawyer, Hero de Seychelles, was in some ways the committee's most surprising member. Hero's godmother was Marie Antoinette. Do you have shortages of soap in Paris as we have in Nîmes? So I said to him, are you making a comment about the capital in general or just about me? <laughs> it was this group of men that Robespierre joined on the 27th of July, 1793. Ah, Honoured citizens, salutations. Yes, welcome to the Queen's boudoir. So this is where she powdered her cheeks? All four of them. <laughs> <laughs> They're people who are absolutely consumed by the public work of, of pushing the revolution onwards. They really do come out of obscurity. These essentially obscure provincials um, find themselves running a country, running a war effort, and, and in a sense sort of grow into that role, but also very clearly are always wrestling with, with the, the immensity of the task they've set themselves. Revolutionary France had declared war on its neighbours, but by 1793, the Republic was fighting for its life. Five imperial armies were massed on her borders, with the Austrians in the north just three days' march from Paris. Each imperial army had promised to crush the regicides and annihilate the new Republic. A ruinous economic blockade had reduced much of the country to famine, and civil war was simmering in the Vendée and the south. There are those who say that the state terror that was about to unfold was not the result of an excess of idealism, but this incredible external duress. The committee member appointed to organize France's defense was Lazare Carnot. There are some figures like Lazare Carnot who are really bureaucrats, who make sure that enough bread, enough flour, enough you know, salt fish and so on gets to the soldiers who are in the field and they don't freeze their rear ends off in, in misery. I would begin with the state of affairs in... Um, unless, of course, you wish to... Uh... No, no. Please, why don't you... Um... I would prefer to listen. Very well. The Army of the North. Uh, this was captured two days ago from the Austrians just outside Antwerp. It doesn't tell us anything we didn't already suspect. England has permanent designs on Dunkirk and Toulon. The Duke of York would not reject the crown if it were offered. Austria and Prussia want to take bites out of Ardennes and Lorraine, and the Dutch will be allowed to nibble some of the north. No one will be left out. They all want a piece of beautiful France. Yes. Even the little king of Sardinia has dreams that he will one day place his fat ass in Provence. <laughs> <laughs> Their plan is to dismember this country. We are not Poland. This committee is not just a group of futile students in Warsaw. The French Republic exists. It is a product of philosophy, but it is also a product of real events. And behind the idea is the sovereign people. 
20 million Frenchmen aching to enter the age of Rousseau. Very good. We're not short of speeches in the army. We are, however, short of nearly everything else. The Army of the North has two million pounds of gunpowder. It requires 30 million pounds of gunpowder. The Army of the Moselle is constantly short of bread. Almost all the other armies are short of shot, cartridges, shoes, horses, and most importantly, copper. God made France beautiful, but he did not supply us with copper for our cannon. Uh, you will notice that we are in receipt of a small supply from uh, Hungary. From between the legs of the Habsburg Emperor. <laughs> we can always count on our enemies to stab each other in the back. <laughs> Most of our cannon are forged from copper that is scavenged from our own barns, from French churches, from bells, from the altars, from icons from confessional boxes. Cannons out of confessional boxes. I call that progress. Mm. As for gunpowder, <laughs> this committee must act now to enforce a national search for saltpeter. Every French citizen must scrape every attic, every cellar, and it must be made an act of patriotic duty. This can be done. Good. But our real problem a real supply problem is with our generals. Damn them. I cannot use a single cavalry regiment with confidence because I know royalists hide there. I cannot entirely trust a single battalion of infantry because I know an officer may take those men across the line to fight on the other side. Have faith, citizen. Remember Valmy. We do not need another Valmy, George. Valmy was a patriotic sensation and very nearly a military catastrophe. 100,000 volunteers walking towards the sound of gunfire. I would take another Valmy, citizen. What, men who should have been at the harvest? Men who would have been better employed repairing the roads so that artillery could get to the front? Men who were told to march to the sound of gunfire, men who had never heard the sound of gunfire, and when they did, they were useless. Not one single weapon the same, hundreds of different caliber, many men carrying scythes, pitchforks, to march against the King of Austria. No, chaos. We do not need another Valmy. These men only understood one command, to march against the aristocrats. That is a good command. Oh, it is an excellent command, morally, citizen. But it is no substitute for organization. One forgets how good the late Ancien Regime was at mobilizing resources. There are a lot of beady-eyed procurers of necessary stuff. Those sort of people had a lot to be getting on with. They are kind of rather like you know, Churchill's war cabinet. They're busy, 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 busy. They know all about how to deliver gunshot and cannon and guns. And you can't really have a complete bloody loony sort of really calling the shots. My God, if you read some of the attacks from Robespierre, it would have seen as if you know, they exerted the full dictatorship, just played this game, how can we kill more people? Are people aware that practically, literally, the whole of Europe declared war on France? Foreign powers effectively were deeply involved into helping counter-revolution. At that time, to say Republic is in danger, it wasn't the Stalinist excuse to kill another million of people, and so on and so on. Robespierre in particular was always warning of the dangers of letting one man have too much military power. He looked back to classical antiquity and, and said, you know, look what happened with Julius Caesar, uh, who crossed the Rubicon and turned the army on Rome. And this is something that might happen in France.